Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, in a world full of conflict, how does one manage to negotiate peace? We'll ask Peace Studies pioneer Professor Johan Galtung. So we have a special guest for our viewers and one who is certainly no stranger to being in the stream. I would say he's one of our favourite guests because he comes back so many times. Author Professor Johan Galtung, it's great to have you back here. Same indeed, a pleasure for me. Very good. And we also have sitting next to you Malika Bolau, who's been wrangling the community. We always ask our community about each day's subject, each right. day's guest. Mm -hmm. A little way they're responding very differently to the professor. Right. Can you explain that? Well, they know that they are in or will be in the presence of a professor who's very learned. So they have lots of questions. And we're going to dip into all of them during today's show. But I'll give you just a little taste. A gala on Twitter says, why do some negotiations work and some don't? Now, we'll talk about that during today's show. But of course, for all of you at home, you can join the conversation. Just make sure you use the hashtag AJStream. And to help us with that conversation, we also have an international group of people joining via Google Plus, and they're eager to chat with Professor Galtong about conflict resolution and peace building and a whole lot more. We'll hear their questions all the way through the show. But first, a little background on our guest. He's widely known as the father of the academic field of peace studies, and he's devoted his life's work to peace building and conflict resolution. He's negotiated more than 150 disputes between states and nations around the world. Professor Johan Galtung was also awarded the Right Livelihood Award or Alternative Nobel Prize. That was back in 1987. And he's one of the world's major figures in the movement for global peace. Have we made you blush yet, Professor? Have I? Have you, are you blushing yet with all of that accolades and, uh, and honours that you've accumulated over the years? I am going as strong as ever. <laughs> so and people are asking me whether I'm working as hard as before and the correct answer is more. So you know, I'm 83, but the point is that I'm rewarded by so many successes, if I may put it that way. Okay. And sometimes it has to do with seeds that I was sowing maybe 25, 30 years ago, and lo and behold, they are blossoming. It takes time sometimes. Ooh. And uh, maybe in some cases I was the first to propose an idea, and it takes time. But if you keep in good health, you'll be rewarded. If I had died, let us say, 25 years ago, I wouldn't be so happy as I am today. But you were asking a question. Let me go to that one. Why do some negotiations fail? Because they are negotiations. Maybe that's the wrong thing. Maybe if you substitute the word dialogue, it's better. Because negotiation is debate. Debate is continuation of war by verbal means. It's a question of winning a negotiation. Dialogue is mutual search. So we encourage dialogue. And whenever I'm doing mediation, I try to have every quest every sentence end with a question mark. So Professor, take us inside one of your negotiations. If you want to set the scene and go inside a negotiating room, take us inside. What happens? And be specific. Tell us one particular one that you actually did. So I'm sitting with Taliban. The plural of Talibs. So please don't say Talibans. That's a little bit wrong. And I'm asking them my typical opening question, which is very simple. Tell me about the Afghanistan you would like to live in. So let us say now, to put it very simply, they come up with three answers. Point one, it is not a secular Afghanistan, not a development aid Afghanistan, it's a Muslim Afghanistan. Point two, there is no capital called Kabul. It is not a unitary state in the European sense. It's a loose association of 25,000 villages and eight nations. Maybe we could call it a federation. And point three, we are sick and tired of being invaded. Because somebody once invented the idea that the key to world power is in Central Asia. It's to occupy Central Asia. The famous Tory a geographer who did that in 1904. We are sick and tired of it. Okay, I find these three points reasonable. Then I go, of course, and talk with, let us say, a two-star general in Pentagon. What is the Afghanistan you would like to see? He tells me it's an Afghanistan from which no attack on the United States will come. Okay, 
you may say that the US policy has made it very likely that such attacks will come as revenge and that US has prepared its own insecurity but I accept it right. as a reasonable goal how do you combine that so you see you talk with all parties you ask them questions you find out whether what they say is reasonable legitimate and I test it in terms of human rights basic needs international law uh -huh. and then comes the trick to come up with a solution Can that's the difficult point and that's where you need a little bit of imagination sure. and creativity so professor we, we hear the Google hangout Malika yeah, exactly. they're, they're ready to talk <laughs> to the professor <laughs> you've sparked something now you mentioned <laughs> Afghanistan so I want to go straight to Kirti who's speaking to us from India and has a question go ahead Sure. Um, question to you, Professor, is what kind of a role does the rule of law play in the context of states like Afghanistan? Um, how, how do we ensure the rule of law has a role to play in ensuring sustainability? So, Katie, the rule of law, she's talking about the rule of law and how that, what, how that plays in peace building. I've been so often to Pakistan and I just try to cut it short. I think the basic key are the Pashtuns. And the line that was drawn as a border between then British Empire and Afghanistan by the British Empire, I think in 1913, that line cut through the Pashtun nation, which is 40 million strong. Some of them in Pakistan, some of them in Afghanistan. Now this was a crime against the nation. It's the biggest nation in the world without a state. Now mind you, I'm not saying that Pakistan should give a part to Afghanistan or Afghanistan should give a part to Afghan Pakistan. I'm saying open borders. I don't think you can solve anything in Pakistan or anything in Afghanistan without seeing it as something in conjunction with each other. The open border could then be a part of a Central Asian community. Now, Pakistan has other problems than this one. It has Balochistan, Sindh, it has the antagonism between a very Western elite and let us say an Islamic non-elite. All of that makes it very, very complicated. And, and Professor Kirti's question was really focused more on Afghanistan and the rule of law there. I know you talked about both countries, both neighbors equally, but the rule of law in peace building in Afghanistan itself? depends on which law. There are many laws in this world. Mm. There are many laws. And I'm not qu quite sure which law applies. So I often go to human rights. What has been done by attacking Afghanistan is killing people. That's against the right to life. What has been done by some Afghans against women is a total infraction of human rights. Sure. No doubt about that. But my experience with Taliban is that they understand that and are changing. They understand right. that what they did was totally non-Quranic and was tribal customs up in a Vedic, let us say, isolated region of the world. They are changing. That change does not come from one day to the other. It's a question of helping them with that change and they tell me very explicitly sure. that Can they I are very open to that message but they want to have it from their sisters and brothers right. in Islam. Well, Professor, your Can answer I is just raise a question in our hangout. Mm -hmm. Mike, uh, Mike Jobbins, I hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Hi. Professor. I was wondering, you talk about negotiations and you cited the example of American generals and Taliban fighters, but where's the role of the people who chose not to take up weapons and all that? I mean, aren't we just rewarding in determine letting the people with guns determine the future what's the role of the women of the young people of the civil society who chose not to to get involved on either side of the the fighting and determining the future of Afghanistan you work and you have dialogue with the Taliban about that but I don't think I am the person for it nor are you the persons for it would be particularly Tunisians who already in 1956 under Bourguiba a Muslim country declaring parity between man and woman. So did you just did volunteer the Tunisians, Professor? Did they get their whipping from the whole world for so, that? So, so Professor, how does, if you feel that the Tunisians have the cultural background to do, to, to run this dialogue, do you go to them and ask them, or are they already doing it behind the scenes? How do you pick, how do you pick a nation to say, I think this nation is the right nation to, to have that dialogue? They invite me. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Easy answer. I have a suggestion <laughs> policy that I prefer people to knock on my door and not the other way around. Okay. You see, the point is simply, the point right is simply this. But right. the people who invite me are generally not the parties. So let us say I'm invited to Nepal. I'm invited by the Nepal Human Rights Commission. Neither by the Maoists nor by the Royalists. I'm talking about my first mediation in Nepal, right. 2004. And you see, it goes like that. The invitations come. And why do the invitations come? Because there is such a deficit of proposals. So I, I, I I have, do they come because people are desperate? They're desperate. Okay. I so have associated with myself not only a Thai silk shirt, but also <laughs> the idea <laughs> that's also the idea that I have a tendency to come up with proposals. Sure. And you see these people who are sitting there, who are the leaders, be they state terrorists or terrorists or warlords or Taliban or whatever you call them, are very often short of ideas. They know what they stand for, but they don't know how it could be realized. Sure. Milika. Professor, you mentioned uh, what happens when the invitations come. There's someone here with a video comment who wants to talk about when the invitations don't come. What do you do in those instances? He mentions a, a story. I'll have you listen to it and you can answer after. Dr. Galtung, I saw you speak this week in Washington and you told the story of meeting with a group of congressmen on Capitol Hill a year or two ago. You were briefing them on Afghanistan and ways in which the U.S. might address the ongoing chaos and violence there. Could you tell us that story and in particular their response to you and what that response said about the character of America and its policy making? I was asked to meet with um, eight Congress representatives in the Sam Rayburn building, the office building across the street mm -hmm. from the Congress. And I was telling them what the Taliban had told me. I saw first, of course, in their faces, ah, he has talked with Taliban. Now, whoever has talked with Taliban is probably a Talib himself. But I didn't quite look like a Talib, so you know, you would look better <laughs> like a Talib. <laughs> well, the point only about you could get away with saying that, Professor, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you are well, the only I'll person. <laughs> well, I shouldn't get away with it. But you <laughs> see, the point is this, that when I said those three points, and I said that I think a possible solution would be a permanent coalition government, with the various factions in Afghanistan. Point two, a loose federation with much autonomy to the villages, following the Swiss model. Use the Swiss model. Point three, a community, Central Asian community with the surrounding countries. Point four, basic needs oriented economic policy shared equally among the eight nations and the two genders. And point three, point five, peacekeeping by other Muslim countries. It's a very violent culture. So they looked at me and said, Professor Galtung, sounds interesting, but the people who elect us are not interested in solutions. They're interested in V for victory. And the idea is that when the US has won, we'll tell them what the solution is. Uh, now that doesn't mean? work. That doesn't work. So. What I do, of course, is that I am launching <laughs> this five-point plan a number of places after I feel that even a Mr. Karzai would buy it. Yeah, after I feel that, I'm launching it. And I find that the takers are not Washington, but, others, but Ankara, Turkey. It's, of course, Iran, Tehran. I find interest in Pakistan. I find interest in China. Now imagine that these come together and make a peace conference along such lines. Where would the US be? We are going to need a peace conference any moment now if we don't get to the hangout, Malika. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Emily, I heard you pipe up. Emily and Mana, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, Yeah. great, thanks. Um, speaking of the US, um, because the US has, has drones now, um, they don't have to send soldiers to fight Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, and Israel has the Iron Dome and the wall, what is the incentive for these technologically advanced countries to engage in peaceful conflict resolution when the human cost of war is so low. Could you repeat it for me? Emily, can you sure. sum that up in one line? 
Um, yeah, sure. Um, with things like drones for the U.S. and the Iron Dome in Israel, the human cost of war has become really low. So what's the incentive for these technologically advanced countries to engage in peaceful conflict resolution? It's, of course, a very important question. Now, let us first pay attention to one thing. The conflict is not between Israel and Palestine. The conflict is between Israel and United States on one side, and the Arab world and the Muslim world on the other side. Now, both the Arab world and the Muslim world have important divisions among themselves. It's an enormous conflict. And Israel does its best, I must say, quote unquote, to expand the conflict the way they behave. Now, that they are technically developed has very little to do with it. What has to do with it is their search for secure and recognized borders. That, in my view, they could get by recognizing Palestine, have a little two-state solution inside, and then a six-state solution, a Middle East community of Israel with the five surrounding Arab countries, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine recognized Egypt, and having all of that within a casing, a setting of, let us say, 20 countries, an organization for security and cooperation in West Asia. Now, all of this works in Europe. There's no reason why it couldn't also work in the Middle East. It has been able to bring Germany into a peaceful Europe that today has its own problems. That's very clear. Maybe they have gone too far. Maybe they overstretched themselves. But Professor, it has worked. Uh, uh, is that Jenny out there who had a question? Jenny, hello. Who wanted to jump in? Hi. I, I did actually okay. have another question. but. Um, <clears throat> yeah, to also speak about Western interventions in peace building, I was wondering about, I know that education programs in fragile states can be dangerous for NGOs, since peace building in itself can be seen as a sort of Western imposition in certain settings. Uh, so I was wondering which type of response we should then strive for in terms of education aid, a mere provision of aid to education or a more actively peace building response? We in peace studies see two very important factors in peace building. Mm. One is equity. If you want to build peace between two parties, be that a man and a woman in a marriage, for heaven's sake, look for parity. Don't have one of them exploiting the other. And on the patriarchy, we know who has been on top. The other factor is more spiritual, more mental, and the factor is called empathy. Try to make it possible for the parties in a country, for instance, to understand each other. To be able to say, okay, if I were in your shoes, maybe I would also think like that. But then you have to know how the shoes, where the shoes pinch. You also have to know that many people don't have shoes. Now, having said that, empathy is absolutely basic. Equity and empathy. When I see many NGO programs on peace building, I find a projection of Western culture. I don't find peace. Now, <laughs> in order to make that more distinct and specific, we will have to go into cases. So I just leave it there as a flat statement. I'm really glad you left it there because I'm listening to you and I've been listening to you for the whole of this program. And I'm thinking, the professor has got to be the best husband, the best friend ever, because you seem to have the answer to everything. You have a five-point plan, you have strategies, you've got neutral places to come in. Does that make you great at home, professor? Do you ever argue? Ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you just passed the buck there. Shall I bring in Tunisia? <laughs> We've been married 44 years. Right. She's a Japanese. Let me say one thing, you yes. see. We are from two very different cultures. That is fascinating. So Norwegian and Japanese. Japanese, okay. And it requires a lot of empathy with each other. And I have learned more about what it means to be Norwegian and a Westerner from my wife than I ever knew. And she claims that she's learning a lot about what it is to be Japanese. Now, that's an ongoing agenda, so I would strongly advise, if you want to get married, marry somebody from another culture. It's much more interesting. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, no, don't, don't take it too personally. Don't take it personally. <laughs> 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 Just advice. changing my list <laughs> don't here. Don't take it. Yeah, cross, cross, cross. Let's keep that aside. Uh, point two. 
See, yes, you have, you we have are multi points from, from we, relationships too. We are from different cultures. Yes. But from the same class. Ah. Lower nobility. She is from a samurai family. Uh -huh. I am from, let us say, the only surviving low level nobility family from the Viking Ages. Okay. So when you look at me, you see how far down one can come, you know. So we have Vikings and samurai, that was a good relationship. Vikings, they were mercenaries, they were selling their military skills, and their tragedy was the great Nordic peace, 1714, and the military skills were no more in demand, so you know, it ends up with somebody in peace. Professor, I'm going to ask you to take a breath, because we can, Malika, you warned us, didn't you? You said I once you, s the Professor starts... It's you hard to pull yourself away. Yeah. So, but we're going to do it for a moment. We're going to take all of our hangout, Professor Johan Galtung, to the post show at stream.audizero.com. If you're not already there, I strongly suggest that you log on. But before we leave our TV viewers, here's Malika looking at some of the other stories the stream is following. Just how influential is the U.S. military? One web developer is on a mission to find out by mapping the location of U.S. military installations around the world. Using Defense Department data, Josh Begley's site shows satellite images of U.S. bases from Australia to Alaska. He explains, I'd like to think this collection can begin to approximate the militarized space often understood as empire, but I'm hesitant to call it that. But viewers of his data were less hesitant, labeling it outright as an empire. Begley has pinpointed hundreds of sites, but says there's still more to be done. He's asking others to send him data that may be missing. Our next leads out of London, where student protests against university administrators turned violent. On Wednesday, students occupying a campus building at the University of London were evicted by police. Some protesters criticized the response as being heavy-handed. The university says demonstrators sealed off fire escapes and climbed on balconies, refusing to leave the building. Officials tweeted a statement condemning what they said were aggressive protests. But some dispute just how violent things were. Owen tweets just spoke to the University of London, who confirmed there was no violence before they called the police. Well, the president of the student union tweeted, today's eviction was one of the nastiest, most brutal I've ever seen on campus, spitting with anger. Demonstrators are protesting over the threatened closure of the student union. They're also campaigning for fair worker benefits. And our thanks to Richard for pitching this story. Now, if you're at the protest, send us your updates using hashtag AJStream. Femi? So, Malika, I can't resist it. We have the professor here. Mm -hmm. We have a conflict at a university in London. The union has been closed in a sentence, Professor, <laughs> that's torture for you, I know. How would you resolve that conflict? The students want the union open, the authorities want to close it, they're protesting, it's potentially turning violence. What do they do? To have a union is the freedom of assembly, it's a human right. I don't think that there is much to argue about that one. But I would like to talk with the university to find out what's their problem. Ooh. I would like to talk with them, I would like to sit down and ask questions. And you see, the way we do it, we don't moralize, we don't critique. We would, I would probably ask, what does the union look like that you would like to see? And let me add, I myself, at a much younger age, right. was vice president of the Norwegian National Union of Students. Ah. Now, the right to have a union is deeply enshrined in the human rights. It's not to be argued. That doesn't mean that the university couldn't have some points. Wow. I would like to ask them. Could the University of London afford your negotiating skills? Uh, dialoguing skills. Dialoguing skills. skills. <laughs> <laughs> I we don't know out. how interested they are. All right. My so experience Arthur, with Anglo America is I'm that Anglo America seems to think that they Professor are by God endowed with those skills. All right, so this is perhaps Professor Johan Galton. You'll hear more of his wise words in the post show at stream.adazero.com. On Monday, we look at Israel's plan to evict tens of thousands of Bedouins from the Negev. Critics are calling it ethnic cleansing. Supporters say that relocating Bedouins will benefit them. We will speak to both sides on Monday's program. In the meantime, thanks for watching. We'll be online. Take care.
Shall you oh yes. Those? Hello again. This is the Streams Online Pulse Show. We're talking about peace and conflict and conflict resolution with Professor Johan Galtung. We're going to get right back to the conversation. Professor, are you exhausted yet? Do you still have more wise words for us? You know, the trick is simply to talk with all sides. Mm -hmm. Some of them are unappetizing. You suppress that. And my opening question, as I've said a couple of times, is what does the Middle East look like where you would like to live? What does a marriage look like where you would like to be a party? In other words, you try to have them think positively and in the future. Then you have their way of defining the situation right now, and you ask them, was there some good point in the past that we could learn from? And what are you most afraid of? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We do that a couple of times, and it's incredible how many good ideas emerge. Sure. But there is one condition, talk only with one party at a time. For ah. heaven's sake, don't bring husband and wife together. <laughs> <laughs> that that comes later, that comes <laughs> later. <laughs> Speaking of talking yeah. at one party at a time, let's go to Mike who has a question for you. We'll get an answer and then we'll go back to community. Go ahead, Mike. Professor, you've been doing this for a very long time and, and I was wondering, you know, over the years, what are some of the things that you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting this, this work so many years ago? and what advice do you have for young people who are getting involved in peacemaking and peace building for the first time? How can we draw from your, your wisdom accumulated? Fantastic question. I didn't know that the people high up were in a dark tunnel and didn't see light. I have deep respect for them, you see. Almost all of the presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers that I have met because any one of their critics wouldn't have survived one day in their position. It's a very tough job. But I didn't know that they had no light shining. Mm. And you see, the task of a mediator is to kick a little hole in that tunnel and say, look, how about this? But you put it with a question mark, always with a question mark. And you are prepared for the answer. That's the most stupid thing I ever heard. Mr. Foreign Minister, Your Excellency, could you please explain to me why it is so stupid? And you have a good dialogue going. Mm -hmm. Now, that is point one. Point two out of two points <laughs> 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 would be they are steered by what we call deep culture. They are steered by deep assumptions. Unfortunately, Anglo-America has as a deep assumption that they are the master of good ideas. And that is not necessarily the case. If that had been the case, they wouldn't have been suffering the decline they are suffering right now. Professor, I, I want to take us to some recent news. Of course, we've heard a lot of talk in the news about uh, chemical weapons in Syria. So we've got lots of questions about Syria, but particularly I want to focus on this Facebook comment from Tia. She says, you and member nations tell other nations they can't have weapons of mass destruction while they themselves have them. When will the UN follow through on disarming all nations? And she says when, but that's also an if. I think Putin's initiative of focusing on the weapons rather than on the who done it. About who done it, we may all have our opinions. I'm mediating quite a lot of se in Syria. By Skype, I'm sufficiently much of a coward. I prefer not to travel there right now. Makes sense. I'm confessing that. Anyhow, I thought that was a brilliant move. He got Obama off the hook, as many people have pointed out. That doesn't mean that the Geneva conferences will necessarily succeed. So I'm looking in another direction. When did Syria work? When in the past? And I come to the Ottoman Empire. You see, the point about Syria, just now, very few sentences. It's a minority dictatorship by the Assad junior and senior against the possible majority dictatorship by a Sunni majority. Mm -hmm. Now, to have a choice between two dictatorships is not a very good choice. And the minorities, are scared to death by what an Islamist Sunni leadership might lead to. If you go back to the Ottoman Empire, they had an institution called the Millet. They also had Armenian Christians and Georgian Christians. They had Jews and Maronites and things of different right. kinds, maybe Turks and Kurds, all of that. 
and each one of them had their own little autonomy, a millet, which was run by the religious head of it. And that autonomy could be recreated in a constitution where every Syrian would cast a vote, provincial in the usual territorial division of the country, these are Ottoman provinces by the way, and at the same time cast a vote for his ethnic group, nation, religion the representative, and they would have some kind of a veto in affairs that had to do with them. You see, these Ottomans were quite wise people. They had been running it for 400 years, eh? let's say 1516 to 1916, it took a little bit of talent to go on that way. The US Empire is not lasting that long, 1898 till, I would say, 1953. Wow. Can we do a quick fire quiz? Can you do quick fire, Professor? If we have a quick question, can you do a quick response? Is Depends that okay? Depends on the question. I'll All do my right. best. As <laughs> if I get sued, <laughs> yeah, it's not so <laughs> easy. <laughs> okay, Kirti, make it a quick question. Let's see how quick the response will be. Kirti, go for it. Sure. Uh, so my question is, is there anything more that civilians can do besides casting a vote? What do you think of civilian peace building? Okay. What do you think of civilian peace building? Can civilians do more than just cast a vote, Professor? I believe strongly in civilian peace building, provided the civilians are trained. You have to know what to do, you see. It is not enough to say I'm a peace builder and I'm a good person, I have a good heart. And I know what is wrong and what is right, morally. You have to know a couple of things too. So I would judge it by that. And I might like to add, there could be military peace builders. I'm not underestimating the kind of knowledge these people are able to accumulate. So I do not have a strong line between military and civilian, but I would like to see whether they are favoring equity and empathy, trauma reconciliation and conflict resolution. Milika. Well, uh, this is a good question on Facebook that came in from Maru. She says, how do you think the world can dismantle the war machine uh, and the arms sales that feed into many conflicts? In short, can we take the profit out of war? Definitely. They can get rid of that machine by learning how to solve conflict. You see, here comes a basic thesis, and I'm very happy about your question. Wherever there Thank is violence, Bruce. there is underlying the violence and unsolved conflict. Violence is the smoke, the unsolved conflict is the fire. There is something called journalists, they are smoke specialists. They don't go down to the conflict, mm. they report smoke. They're called journalists and all they're trained. All journalists, would you say? I would say almost she all says of them. Defensively almost back. all of them, the only exception being Al Jazeera. Of obviously, course. thank yeah, you. Obviously. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I would say it is entirely possible, and I'll draw a parallel. How did the world get rid of duels? Of people simply fighting each other with swords or drawing pistols and so on, according to certain rules, by having a court process. So they fought verbal duels in instead. Verbal duels instead of sword and pistol duels. They got rid of it. Why did they want to get rid of it? Not because they had turned pacifist. They wanted to get rid of it because duels killed too many top aristocrats. And what was even worse, people who were lower down could do themselves up to the top. Now, it's obvious what the similarities are Definitely. with the present situation. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, you are known as the father of peace studies. And so, as we've been listening to the conversation, we understand exactly why that would be. But who else do you admire in the world of dialoguing? Who do you look up to or who do you respect? I think Jimmy Carter does a good job as an example. I'm not so sure he did that good a job as a president, but as an ex-president. And of course he has all the experience. Right. He has a very softening, mellow approach. He has that when he enters. I wish he had more concrete solutions to offer, it, if you will. I'm not so happy about Dalai Lama. I met him many times. But his mantra is compassion, compassion, compassion. I agree completely, empathy should have compassion, but it it's too vague, you see, too weak. It has to be more concrete, to put it that way. So I'm looking at that Dalai Lama, maybe, uh, former President Clinton, you were all 
fathers of peace studies or your say your you know your peer that's that's your peer group so if you're the father of peace studies who will be your children who's the next generation coming up there are many of them I'll prefer not to mention name but we have a lady in Norway together with others who have brought bullying in schools down to almost zero in some Norwegian schools by simply asking the bully what you did is totally unacceptable but why did you do it and what comes out from the bully in very many cases is not he had anything about against the other student that he was bullying but he hates school and he suspects the other student of being a school lover. Yeah. It's school haters against school lovers. Then you ask him, what's wrong about school? And here, of course, we are critiqued. You ask that bully who has broken all rules for pedagogical advice? Yes, I do. Maybe he has thought through something. And we have had a number of former bullies who have become the assistants of the teachers in combating bullies. I thought you were going to say heads we of have state. <laughs> in Mexico, we have another person who has contributed enormously to judicial mediation mm. and to peace education in schools. And I could go country for country, I could go in Japan, reconciliation, reconciliation as a drama. And of course they're thinking particularly about Japan relative to China and Korea and the Pacific War as it is called. So Professor, are you encouraged by the new generation of dialoguers coming up? Do, I do. I do my very best and I practice the teachings, praise and race. Praise and race. I mean, my task is to share my experience of 60 years with the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And um, well, they take to it like ducks to water or whatever kind of metaphor you would like to. Some are better than others and um, I've just mentioned three examples. We have 20 countries that are working very well. So Professor, I, I can, I'm taking a sneak peek at our Google Hangout. I see that they're all smiling broadly as you're speaking. <laughs> they won't be smiling quite so broadly when I tell them we're done <laughs> right now. <laughs> but Malika, how's the community been reacting to this conversation? Um, uh, there's still more questions coming, but luckily the professor is on Twitter. Yes, but let me just show you, Professor, your Twitter site. Okay, so this is the professor's Twitter site. Have a look here. All right, so just to prove it's, it's him. Scoot down here. The last time he tweeted, the 28th of November, 2012. So you're obviously too busy dialoguing around the world to tweet, Professor, right? 20th of November 2012. Yeah. What sins have I committed on that day? <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time you tweeted. So they could tweet the professor, but I recommend that maybe the best way to get to him is this way at www.transcend.org. And uh, if the invitation is intriguing enough, I suspect you'll hear from Professor Johan Galtung. I'm not good at Twittering, I'm not good at the social media. You see, if you are 83, to have been able to catch on with most of the things <laughs> in the <laughs> internet is already quite something. And you're how old again, Professor, just so we can just catch that, how old? 83? Pardon me? 83. 83. Excellent, and still going strong. I have to wrap this up, Malika, it's a shame. <laughs> now I know what it's like to be sitting in the same room as Professor Johan Galton. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Hangout as well. Let's look ahead to Monday. We look at Israel's plan to evict tens of thousands of Bedouins from the Negev. Critics are calling it ethnic cleansing. Supporters say relocating Bedouins will benefit them. We'll speak to people on both sides of that debate. Until then, we'll be online at stream.aljazeera.com. Thanks for watching. Take care.